Hi everyone! It is now time for the BioNYA installment of Finals in a Pod, brought to you by Study Sheep and Addendum. Professor Michelle Somi is so amazing that she will be giving a whole summary of the course. We hope that this podcast helps you. Welcome to BioNYA. There's a lot of material, so I'm just going to try and be as informative as possible. So the macromolecules, you have to realize which one are a monomer and which one are a polymer. So for example, in the carbohydrates, glucose is a monomer. And you assemble monomers together with the reaction dehydration that releases a molecule of water to eventually form polymers. Uh, In the carbohydrate, glucose, as you know, is formed by uh, photosynthesis. And it can be by, in plants, reassembled as a disaccharide, only two units. That's not yet a polymer, which is sucrose. And that's transported in the phloem, in the veins, if you want, of plants. It consists of a fructose and a glucose. Eventually, plants will store the glucose in starch. That's how they store their energy. It's a bulky way of storing energy. It's composed of this alpha glucose. There's two types of glucose both formed by photosynthesis, and plants store their extra energy as starch. We as animals store our extra carbs, some of it as glycogen in our liver or our skeletal muscle, but it's only for a sprint. We as animals, we're mobile, we store most of our energy as fat. There's another type of disaccharide that mammals produce, it's lactose, it's milk sugar, and that is composed of glucose and galactose. Plants have a cell wall. It's an extra layer over the plasma membrane. Animals don't have a cell wall. And their cell wall is a cellulose. It's composed of a different type of glucose. It's a beta-glucose, and we cannot digest this molecule. And therefore, that's the fibers in our diet. You have to remember that also fungi, mushrooms and company, have also a cell wall, and that's composed of chitin. That's also polysaccharides. In carbohydrates, the polymers are called polysaccharides. Uh, You also find chitin in the exoskeleton of arthropods, which include insects. Now, if you think of the group of proteins, the monomer are amino acids, and you join the 20 different amino acids through a process called translation. That's protein synthesis. It occurs in a structure called a ribosome. So all proteins are made inside of a ribosome. And proteins can be composed of many chain of amino acids, which are called polypeptide. It's important to recognize peptide because it's the link in between amino acid. It's the bond. Peptide bond is important to remember that is what links amino acid together. So there's different types of proteins, some more important than others in your study. For example, enzymes are catalysts. And hemoglobin transports oxygen in your red blood cells. Antibodies attack foreign molecules or disease. And actin is important. It's in your exoskeleton. It's inside cells. So those are the ones I remembered are the most important for you to realize that these are protein, maybe collagen also in your skin. So another type of monomer are nucleotides. They're composed of a nitrogen base, a sugar, and a phosphate. And you assemble them together to form a polymer, which is, you got to know DNA. you got to know that that's a polymer. And that's a universal code of life. So it's a double helix with sugar and phosphate sides, like a ladder. And inside are the nitrogen space that are linked together. Adenine A is linked to thymine with two hydrogen bond. And cytosine is linked to guanine with three hydrogen bond. It's worth your while to know your structure of DNA. So you make DNA, you replicate it, or duplicate if you prefer, in interphase during the S phase. So you have to remember that in interphase, after the S phase, you have double the amount of DNA in your cells. They're preparing for cell division. You also tie nucleotides together when you make the RNA. The RNA are single strand of nucleotides, and you look at the code on DNA, and you copy it. And that process of copying, if you remember the word transcription, what it means is copying. 
copying the code of DNA to make RNA. There's different types of RNA. They're single strand and they can leave the nucleus through the nuclear pore and together they work to make a protein. So they're involved in protein synthesis, which is translation. So you have an mRNA that has a recipe to make a specific polypeptide, a protein if you prefer. You have the tRNA that will bring the ingredients, which are the amino acid. And all of this is done in a ribosome and the there's a type of RNA inside, which is rRNA. So go with what your teacher explained. So the next topic to know are your cells. There's prokaryotic cells and there's eukaryotic cells. And what is inside them? So prokaryotic cells are like bacteria and they have a special cell wall that's made of pepsidoglycan. It's a combination of protein and sugar. And there's antibiotic that penicillin that can attack the cell wall of bacteria. So usually an antibiotic attacks something in bacteria, for example, that you don't have. So they have a special cell wall. All cells have a plasma membrane, have DNA to control the activity inside of the cell and some ribosome to make proteins. So that's the basic, what they have. Bacteria, they're very small. Now, after that, you have to know what's in an eukaryotic cell. In NYA, we talk about a plant and an animal cell. There's also fungi. You hear little things uh, that are in the other ones. But you have to know your organelles and what they do and what's in a plant cell and not in an animal cell and vice versa. So, for example, the cell wall is in plant cell, as I just mentioned, is cellulose or fungi. That's chitin. But the animal cells don't have one. So when you put these plant cells and fungi cells in a hypotonic solution, just pure water, let's say, they are protected from exploding. But animal cells, they would explode because they don't have a cell wall protecting them. So you got to tie your concepts together to be solid for your test. The plasma membrane is like a phospholipid bilayer. I'll talk about it in a minute. And it's a semi-permeable layer. So polymers don't go through it, but monomers, yes, in different ways. The DNA is the universal code of life, A with T and C with G, the same in bacteria than in eukaryotic cell. But, and it controls the activity of the cell by making these proteins. The ribosome is where you make your proteins, and it's two subunits that were made in, I'm jumping a little bit, in the nucleolus that is in the nucleus. So eukaryotic cells, what it means is that they have a nucleus. And inside is the DNA that's on coil that's called chromatin. So you don't visibly see it. You'll see the DNA if you want when it's condensed as chromosome during cell division. So the nucleus has a nuclear envelope with pores and things can come in and out to the nuclear pore. So your RNA can leave. They were born in the nucleus and they're in the cytoplasm to make your protein. Or the proteins are all made in the cytoplasm. And some of them, like enzymes, need to go and work in the nucleus, like to make RNA. It needs an enzymes, RNA polymerase, for example. So attached to the nuclear envelope is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And that's for exporting protein. So the next three organelles is like a corridor for shipping polymers. So you have the rough ER, so you have a free ribosome becoming bound on the rough ER. That's why it's called rough. It has bound ribosome. And then the protein could travel to the ER and go to the next station, which is Golgi to vesicles. The smooth ER is a really interesting one, organelle that makes lipids. So your lipids are like your fat, your phospholipids, which are a major component of membrane. And for example, cholesterol, which is a steroid. It also, in your liver, would detoxify uh, pesticide, medication. So these organelles can grow in size if the demand increases and they can shrink. The Golgi is a, called a prison without walls because it stores and changes a little bit and then delivers when it's time. So your proteins that you need to export, like, for example, insulin that's traveling in your blood, was stored in your Golgi until your blood sugar fluctuated. Your blood sugar, as you know, is glucose. Okay, so glucose is crucial for making your energy, your cellular energy, which is ATP. So the Golgi also can secrete the cell wall in plant cells, the cellulose laying of that cell wall when a cell grows a little bit. It's true to Golgi. 
and in the cell plate in cell division uh, for a plant cell. The vacuole differs if you're in a plant or in an animal. It's huge in a plant cell. It's like a storage area. But in an animal cells, there are different little jobs for them. There's osmoregulation role for a contractile vacuole. If you have a freshwater unicellular organism that doesn't have a cell wall like a paramecium, it water is entering it and it would explode if it's not always pumping water out. So that's what I mean by osmoregulation. They have to control the amount of water that is in their, their unicellular cell. The food vacuole is an interesting one. When they do phagocytosis and ingest something, that what they put it in is a food vacuole. And then lysosome would come and fuse to it and do intracellular digestion. So lysosome were made by the Golgi. And there's another type of organelle that is similar but not made by this, uh, by the Golgi or the endomembrane system is a pyroxysome. So it breaks down lipids. Uh, that would be the, the work of it. In a plant, it would be the developing seed that needs to break down the oil that's in the seed for the little seedling to grow. Or it also can break down alcohol in humans, uh, in your liver. The centrosome is a dense area, not membrane bound. And in animals, we have centrioles in it, but not in plant cells. And the centrosome makes the cytoskeleton, which is a scaffolding that holds the organelles together and things walk on it to go to destination, like a train track. And also the mitotic spindle during cell division, which is a special cytoskeleton during cell division. So you got to know your chloroplast that it's inside is a stroma. There's little stacks that are called thylakoid where the pigment is. And the stack is called granum or grana. So just remember those names belong to a chloroplast. And you know chloroplast is for photosynthesis. It would be in, for example, plants, the green parts, or algaes. You got to remember that mitochondria is in both plants and animal. That could be evaluated. And it's your powerhouse for making your energy. Your energy is ATP. So the process of making your energy by burning molecule, like we are heterotroph, we need to eat to get molecules to burn, oxidize, to make our energy. So the organelle that burns, oxidize, and make our cellular energy ATP is the mitochondria, and the inside is the matrix. So you got to remember plants also need energy. Bottom line, you need that ATP. So they do photosynthesis, they make glucose, and then they can burn it to make their ATP. That's why they're considered autotroph, self-sufficient, not need to eat something. So the plasma membrane is an important topic. It's referred to the fluid mosaic model. It's a phospholipid bilayer that was made by the smooth ER, as you remember. There's integral protein that are embedded, transmembrane also called, and therefore transport for things to come in or out. You also have some peripheral protein. They have different roles. Usually we don't evaluate that because it's quite numerous, the different types of role. There's cholesterol in the membrane. If you're an animal, it would influence the fluidity. And there's sugar coating on the outside surface of your cells. And those are attached on a protein or on a phospholipid and therefore cell uh, recognition. So a big thing to know is that there's two major category of uh, transports. So there's passive and active. So the passive, it, the word says it, is going from a high area to a low area. And it's just a kinetic energy of the molecule going to available space. It doesn't require ATP. It doesn't even require that the cell is alive. So it leads to equal on each side of the membrane, equilibrium. Active is the other way around. You go from low to high, you need to pump it in, force it, and that uses ATP. And in some cases, you don't want equal. Like if it's a poison, for example, you don't want it in your cell. The cell would try to pump it out, for example. So it, it involves pumps. We don't go into huge detail about different types. In everything we talk about, there's always more to know. But we focus on the passive transport. Simple diffusion is when you have something going through the phospholipid layer. There's nothing stopping it. It's like ghosts going through your wall. So that's for fat-soluble molecule like a pesticide, alcohol, eater. The one you need to know is gases like oxygen and CO2. They can diffuse through the phospholipid layer. That's super important. So what determines the direction is where the high is and where the low is, right? 
and you don't reach equilibrium hopefully because you have a heart beating and then you're circulating your gases, right? So carrier facilitate diffusion, uh, there's other names. There's a channel one, but it involves an integral protein and it's for something hydrophilic and a monomer. So remember, polymers don't go through. They have to be wrapped in a vesicle and they have to come in and out. And that's a type of active transport, endocytosis or exocytosis. But like an amino acid, glucose would have to go through an integral protein. It's a specific one. Ions also. The big one to know, you can't get away in NYA without osmosis. Osmosis is a movement of water from a high water area to a lower water area. So the area that has a higher water content is the hypotonic solution. I'm French. I go hypo, lots of O, water. Okay. And hyper, you think of lots of sugar or lots of solute. There's more solute than water. So it's always comparing two solutions across the membrane, a semi-permeable membrane. So plants and animal cells react differently to the different types of solution. So if you pluck a plant cell in a hypotonic solution, they love it. It's like when, when you water them, they have a cell wall and they get full of water and they get turgid, it's called. They get nice and stiff and they're happy. But if you pluck an animal cell, the example is a red blood cell in pure water, they'll explode because the water comes in and there's not a cell wall to protect them and it's like overinflating a balloon. So definitely not good, death, burst. In isotonics, that's when you make a solution that's exactly the same as in your cell. It's usually 0.85% salt. Therefore, if you put a plant cell in an isotonic solution, they won't be too bad, but they'll be limpy a little bit. So they're not so great. But for us, where blood cells are circulating in the liquid portion of your blood, which is the plasma, it's equal to concentration and your cells are nice and the shape, then they're healthy. So they prefer animal cells to be in the same concentration solution. In a hypertonic solution, that's a little bit more salty than you want, for example, the plant cells would die. Like if a dog pees on the grass, it kills the grass because the urine is hypertonic. And animal cells, we would shrivel up a bit. If you swim in the ocean, you'll be a little bit thirsty after that because the ocean is a little bit more salty than our body fluids. So cell division is another big topic that you have to know. So you have to know your mitosis, you have to know your meiosis, and a little bit the differences in between the two. So mitosis, the rule is that you form identical cells, and you got to remember that it could be a diploid cell or a haploid cell. So in animals, we're diploid cells forming all of our cells of our body, but you'll see in plant cells, there's a haploid cells being formed by mitosis, or in fungi, all their cells are haploid. No matter how many chromosomes, this is diploid because there's two big ones, two small ones from two different parents, blue and pink. But it would be the same for haploid because the chromosomes align one behind each other in the metaphase. And the legs of the chromosome, which are called chromatids, separate and becomes individual chromosomes. So the chromosome doubles at that phase. In meiosis one, it's very different than mitosis because the pairs, the chromosome from your mom and from your dad, so it has to be diploid, find each other and they exchange genes. So in prophase one, you find the matching pair, which the couple is called a tetrad, the pair of homologous chromosome. And crossing over is when they exchange gene in between each other to form variation, genetic variation. Therefore, in metaphase, they align in pair, not one behind each other. They're as couple. And then how they align varies the members of a pair. And that forms a huge source of variation. That's called independent assortment. And then the pairs at anaphase 1 separate and forms haploid cells in meiosis 2. So we say that meiosis 2 is similar to mitosis in the behavior of the chromosome. So in metaphase 2, for example, the chromosomes align one behind each other like you see here, but it would be haploid, less chromosome. And in anaphase 2, the legs, the chromatids separate like we see here but with less chromosome because it's haploid. So I know it's a lot of information for just a little review, but that's what you have to pay attention when you study. In genetics, there's patterns to notice. So there's Mendel Genetics that he did a monohybrid cross comparing peas that varied for just one thing. 
and that's why it means monohybrid one trait. So the example in the book is that he bred purple flowered peas with white peas and saw that all the babies, the F1 first generation, were all purple. He physically dusted the pollen of the white flower onto the purple so he knew the white was hiding and therefore the purple was dominant. The purple flower of the babies is as purple as the parent. So he realized purple is dominant. And then when he let them self-pollinate, because these flowers have both pollen and ovule, three purple flowers or three plants producing purple flower to one plant producing white flower. That's the phenotypic ratio. Phenotype is what you see, the expression of the gene. So he got his first law of segregation from that, those crosses, and he realized individual had two alleles, two recipes, one from each parent. And they separated during gamete formation. Remember, gamete, sperm, or egg, or haploid have only one recipe of each. And he also realized that the baby of a two pure breed uh, parents is always a mutt, a hybrid, a heterozygous. Heterozygous meaning it has two different recipes, white and purple. So it would be like here, a purple, you put it capital because it's dominant, and the white, you put it... Um, lowercase because it's the recessive alley, right? So therefore, the F1 are always a mutt, a hybrid, a heterozygous from two pure parents. So that's his first law. Now, he couldn't tell of the three types of purple, which one are heterozygous or which one are homozygous dominant having the two same allele. So when you have an unknown genotype, a purple flower, I don't know what's in it, you breed it with a known, which is the white flower. You're sure the white flower has to have two recessive alleles to be white. So therefore, there's two scenario in here. So maybe the purple flower has two alleles that are purple, or it's heterozygous, has a purple and a white. So if you breed it to the white, and all the babies are purple, then it tells you that the unknown purple flower you were using was homozygous, had the two purple that always hide the white. But let's say you breed again another purple flower from the garden of Mendel, and you breed it with a white cross-pollinate, and you start to see white flowers as offspring. That confirms that the purple flower you just used had a hiding white recipe for you to get white flowers. So that's called a test cross. So this is not Mendel, but it's still like one gene. It's incomplete dominance. So sometimes both alleles are expressed, and that's called incomplete dominance. So, for example, in Snapdragon, there's a red flower, and then you breed it with a white flower, and boom, the F1 is pink. It's an in-between. And the F1, as you know, is always the heterozygous because you're breeding two pure-breed plants. And therefore, when you left the F1 self-pollinate, you have a phenotypic ratio, what they, you see, as one red, two pink, and one white. Here you don't need to do a test cross because each uh, color flower has its own genotype. So the red are homozygous for red, the pink are heterozygous, and the white are homozygous for white. So the dihybrid cross is when there's two traits, that's Mendel. And he knew from his monohybrid cross what was dominant already. So he bred a homozygous yellow and round with a wrinkle and green. And the F1, if he didn't know what was dominant, would tell you what's dominant. It shows you. And the F1 were yellow and round. Now, when they let the F1 self-pollinate, they form four types of gametes, ovules and pollen. And the ratio of the F2 is always 9 3, 3, 1. And you have nine looking like the F1 are both trait dominant. Three that they are one trait dominant, the other recessive. The other trait, flip it over, and then only one that is both trait recessive. So he saw from this data that the two traits were independently inherited. So if we just, in your shape, and just look at color, and you add all the yellow versus the green, it's still a three to one, a monohybrid cross. So he saw that they were independently inherited because they were on different pairs of chromosome, the two traits. Epistasis is like a dihybrid, but one gene interferes with the expression of the other. It allows to be expressed or not. And you see it in Labrador dog. There's a gene for color, either black or chocolate. 
And there's another gene that either allows a brown or a chocolate. So there's a recessive combination that leads to albinos, which is a yellow lab. So it's still a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, but two combination, the ones with the little e, are yellow labs. So it's a 9 to 3 to 4. So humans have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes, uh, and the 22 of the 23 are autosomal. It means it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, hemoglobin is hemoglobin, hair color is hair color, and so on. And the last pair is uh, the sex chromosome. And there it matters if you're a woman or a man for inheritance. So there's autosomal recessive uh, traits or disorders. Um, and therefore, in a pedigree, a man is written as a box and a woman is as a circle. And if they're not affected, it's not shaded. If they are affected, it's shaded. And in the case of an autosomal recessive disorder, they would be homozygous recessive. You need two little recipes to have the disorder. There's some that are autosomal dominant. Usually, it's so rare, the dominant mutation, that the one that is affected is heterozygous. You usually don't have enough of that very rare uh, dominant allele like dwarfism to have two. And actually, it's lethal to have two. So I want to point out that sex linked is uh, XXXY. Women are XX and men are XY. So... When you form gametes that are haploid, the ovum has a X and the sperm either has a X or a Y. So depending on which sperm fertilizes, the Y makes a baby boy and the X makes a baby girl. So you're seeing that the sperm determines the sex of the offspring. The other thing you have to notice that when it's a boy, for example, the X comes from the mother because the Y came from the dad. So that's what you have to realize is the X in man came from the mother. So if it's a disease on the X chromosome, the disease is usually more common in men because they only have one X. They can't hide it. It's usually recessive. And it came from the mother. So that's what you have to pay attention. So usually it's sex link recessive. The woman could be a carrier if she has a little hiding recessive allele. And it's very rare that a woman is affected. That means her dad had to have it and her mom was a carrier. Maybe not having the disease, but hiding in her. So usually it's men and they get it from a woman, a mother that is a carrier. And then men are therefore more affected like hemophilia or color blindness, for example. So I'm in unit three, the domain bacteria. And the prokaryotes, we talked about it. You have to realize there's some heterotroph or autotroph. Heterotroph, they could be decomposer, breaking down dead matter. They could be disease, but they also are crucial for nitrogen fixing. There are some that are photosynthetic. They're the cyanobacteria, and they do photosynthesis without a chloroplast. In the domain eukarya, the ones that are composed of eukaryotic cells, there's the protus in there. There's some without a cell wall that are heterotroph, they're animal-like. And they are classified on how they move, like paramecium with the cilia or amoeba with the pseudopod. You have to pay attention to the algae that are photosynthetic. They have a chloroplast. And that the green algae are the ancestors to land plant. You have to remember that the kingdom fungi are heterotrophs and they have a cell wall. So there's an issue of feeding. They have to secrete their enzyme outside of their body and break down the, the polymers into monomers and then absorb them. They are unicellular like the yeast, but most are multicellular like mushrooms. And their tissue is made of haploid cells. They have a big role as being decomposers. Also, remember the word sapro belongs to fungi. Now, pay more attention to kingdom planta. Kingdom planta is really important. Their life cycle is alternation of generation. There's a sporophyte and a gametophyte. The sporophyte is diploid and the gametophyte is haploid. So remember the sporophyte makes spores, but it's by meiosis because the spores are haploid. It's the only meiosis in a story. The spores develop to form the next stage, which is the gametophyte. That's by mitosis. And the gametophyte, it says, makes gametes. And therefore, they make their gametes by mitosis. And the little fertilized egg, which is a zygote, is diploid and will form the multicellular next generation, which is a sporophyte by mitosis. So there's four phyla, in plural, of plants. There's the bryophyta, which are the moss. The gametophyte, the carpet of moss, is a big part. It's dominant. The gametophyte is dominant. It's the first one to have evolved from an algae. 
and they have evolved a wax cover to protect themselves from drying out. And they spread by spores, so they kind of evolved the sporophyte stage. The uh, green algae ancestor was a gametophyte, and they didn't have the sporophyte stage. There's stuff that's primitive, like they have to swim. The sperm has to swim to the egg. It's because they were an algae once, and that was all right in the water. And they have no vascular tissue. So the vascular tissue was evolved in the fern, the pyrophyta. There, the fern is a sporophyte dominant. There's vascular tissue, which is like veins, xylem and phloem. Xylem is to drink water and mineral, and it makes them taller. It's like a backbone a little bit. And phloem is to transport sucrose up and down to go and store it. They have also doors to close the stoma, which is a pore, means mouth, so not to lose too much water when they do gas exchange by transpiration. And um, the sperm don't still swim to the egg. So the most advanced one are the coniferophyta, also called gymnosperm, like the pine, or the flowering plant, uh, which are either angiosperm or angiophyta. So what they have more than the other is that they have evolved a pollen grain for delivering the sperm instead of swimming. And they put the baby in a little seed to protect it from drying out. So that's the biggest thing to remember. Um, the Pines are still relying on wind to get the pollen to the ovule, so that's not precise. So the flowering plants are the most advanced. They evolve flowers to attract an insect or a bird, a pollinator, to get dusted with pollen and deliver their pollen to the next uh, flower for cross-pollination. And once the flower gets fertilized, it turns into a fruit, and in the fruit is the seed. So the fruit is to eat and spread the seed. So they're the most evolved. In the kingdom animalia, so much to tell you. Um, the porifera are the most uh, primitive ones. They don't have much tissue. They're filter feeders. If they have a symmetry, it's round. They have a top, bottom, no right, left, and, and, and sides. It's radial symmetry. The, um, the uh, nidarians have all stinging cells. There's two body shapes. They have two of the germ layer, ectoderm and mesoderm. And they have radial symmetry. The flatworms are bilateral uh, symmetry, and they have a head, and they move in one direction. All of that came evolved together. So the head is like a mass of nervous tissue. They pre uh, present that first to check out what's going on, and therefore they move in a specific direction to check out what's going on. So it's a package deal. It's more advanced to have a head and thinking. So they have the three germ layers. It's called tripoblastic. Two muscles is the mesoderm. And they're no body cavity, so they don't have a space inside to sit their organs. That's what it means, acylome. So pay attention to that. That's important. The nematodes, the, the nematoda, are pseudocylomates. They have a space for their organs, but it's not yet perfect. There's no muscle around their digestive tube. Um, then after that, everybody is a, have a perfect body cavity that's completely lined with mesoderm. And there's two ways to get to it. There's a protostome that forms their mouth first, and their cells all specialize at the same time, which is called determinant, uh, versus the deuterostome, which um, have formed their anus first, which is strange. And they don't, not all their cells specialize at once, like they have stem cells to specialize later, which is better. So you have to know who is who. The earthworm and company analide. Ha, our protostome silomate have a closed circulatory system. The arthropods, the insects and company, are, have an open circulatory system, has an exoskeleton of chitin and articulated limbs. They have a respiratory system that's a tracheal system if they're on land. The mollusca are a mixed group of organisms that um, have a either open or closed circulatory system, and they either have gills if they're aquatic or lungs on land. The echinodermata have a radial symmetry as an adult. They're like us. They're silomates de terostome, so we are also de terostome. And they have a unique water vascular system. So we are in the chordata, which have specific common features to be put in that group. One of them is not backbone. So you have to remember that not all chordata have in colonne vitrebale a backbone. So in the ones that do have a backbone, we look at the different classes, like in fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So you got to 
we cut down the material, look at the evolution of the respiratory system and the circulatory system. So the first one you encounter are insects if they live on land and they have a tracheal system. F um, aquatic organisms have gills and the fish have gills with gill filament and the water moves opposite to the blood flow for maximum loading of oxygen. It's called countercurrent. Amphibians have lungs and a positive pressure breathing where they force air in lungs that have a higher pressure. It's not a great system. And they need to get oxygen with their moist skin also. So birds have lungs and air sacs, and it's a two cycle to move the air through and ventilate, and it's a very advanced cycle. The uh, mammali mammalians, us, we have a negative pressure breathing. You gotta remember to inhale, you got to have muscle contraction like your diaphragm and your chest expands, and that creates a lower pressure and the air moves towards a lower pressure. That's what we mean by negative pressure breathing. And when you exhale, the muscles relax, your chest gets smaller, your volume increase, and then the air comes out. That's a passive exhalation. You need to know the flow through the pipes, the airway, um, to your respiratory system. You gotta put in check your evolution of your circulatory system. Some have an open circulatory system where the blood is not always transported between, uh, within blood vessel and it leaks like an hemorrhagie. So that's the, uh, arthropods and the two groups of the mollusks. Um, the closed circulatory system is way better because you can circulate the blood within blood vessel with a blood pressure. So that's better. So the Annelidae, some mollusks like the squid and octopus, and all the vertebrates, fish and company, have a closed circulatory system. The fish have one circuit. It takes a long time to get through, and they have a two-chambered heart. The atrium is always receiving blood, and the ventricles is always sending blood out of the heart. The amphibians have a two-circuit. So there's a going to the lungs pulmonary, coming back to the heart, and then systemic is everywhere else, all the other organs. That's better. It's more rapid. and But they have a three-chambered heart, so they have a single ventricle where the blood mix, oxygen-rich and, and oxygen-poor, and that's not as great. So we have an evolution of having a wall separating the ventricle into two. It's not complete in the reptiles, but it is complete in the bird and the mammal. So the bird and mammal are warm-blooded. They invest energy keeping their body temperature warm, and that's better than being cold-blooded ectotherm. The rest are cold-blooded. So you need to know your flow to your heart, that the right side is oxygen poor, it's colored blue, and the right, uh, the, sorry, the left side is oxygen rich blood. So your system, uh, your pulmonary, uh, circuit is leaving the right ventricle going to the pulmonary trunk and arteries, going to get oxygenated to the lungs, to lungs, and coming back as pulmonary veins. That's your pulmonary circuit. Then you're arriving in the left side of the heart, which is transports oxygen-rich blood, and that will pump it through the aorta to all your organs, lungs, and come back as blue blood, oxygen-poor blood, via the two vena cava. So this one is the systemic group. In evolution, you need to know the population um, uh, genetics, which is the hardy wine birth. So there's two equations. This is for individual. Those are the homozygous dominant, the heterozygous, and the homozygous recessive. It's best to try and calculate everything to, to that it adds up to one to make sure you didn't make a mistake. So what you have to recognize is what they give you, and then you can use your formula to find whatever they're asking you. So P plus Q are frequencies of allele. P is the frequency of a dominant allele, and then Q is the frequency of a recessive allele. And you have to know the four conditions for this theorem to to work, which is no uh, evolution, no change in the frequencies in your gene pool, no genetic drift. Uh, I'd love to spend more time on that, but there's a series of uh, problems that we give you. You try them. So there's four conditions. You have to have a large population. No founders effect, a little uh, group that went and populated Lac Saint-Jean and they weren't representing the original population, for example. No bottleneck, which is a catastrophe where just a few survive. Like, Animals that are going extinct, there's so many few that there's no more genetic diversity, so the gene pool has changed. Mutation, no change in your DNA because that creates new allele that would change your, your frequencies. 
uh, no people coming in or out, and no selection of mate, which is a little bit interesting. So Darwin is the one that uh, explained evolution. It's the natural selection where you have genetic inherited variation, and it's the environment that selects. It could be uh, artificial, like we select this to breed a type of rose. So it could be artificial, but that's the theorem. So the one that's successful will have more of them in the next generation, the successful variant. So what Darwin thinks is as fitness is how many children you produce that are survive and that are fertile. Then, you know, your gene flow, your genes are uh, going into the next generation. He looked at divergent evolution, which is a common ancestor that decided to do different things from a, a, a structure that's called an homologous structure. So you look at all the different forearms of mammals, a bat wing, a whale flipper, and a human grasping hand. That's all from the same bones from a common ancestor. Convergent evolution is like different ancestors that came to the same solution, the same analogous structure. Like if you look at wings, a wing of an insect is way different than the wing of a bat. Uh, and they both have wings, but it's, it came from a different uh, ancestor. So the natural selection can go different ways. So those are trends of selection. Uh, stabilizing is selecting the middle. It's usually a reproduction. You want a good-sized baby, not too big, not too small. So the middle is best. Uh, stabilizing. Directional is very common. It's one extreme. So therefore, you want to go for, uh, well, antibiotic resistance is an example. You put antibiotics everywhere, and then therefore, the ones that survive are the really mean bugs, you know, really bad bacteria. Uh, disruptive, uh, there's not too many examples, but it would be when your environment, which is selecting the variant, is different. And then you select both extreme, and the middle is not fitting in any of those two extremes. So there's ways that prevent two species from reproducing, and those are reproductive isolating mechanism. Prezygotic is a whole series that prevent the fertilization, the zygote formation, the fertilized egg. So if you live in two different continents, you should never meet. That's habitat. If you, uh, animals have a specific time, they are in breeding season, and it could be at different times, so they are not ready at the same time. That's temporal. Behavioral is interesting. Like birds, they have a so song and dance that's innate in their brain, and therefore it doesn't attract another species. It's not the right dance or song. Mechanical is the parts don't fit, uh, so it could be specific to the species. And gametic is, okay, everything w worked, but the sperm cannot enter the egg because there's a receptor that's species-specific for it to enter and fertilize the egg. So if there was a zygote form, there could be other things that prevent the final result, which would be a healthy, fertile offspring. So there's the baby dies, miscarriage, or the the baby dies early, so hybrid inviability. The one I put a star beside is the one you have to know is reduced hybrid fertility. It's like the horse, female horse that's bred to a donkey, and the mule is healthy but cannot produce sperm because of meiosis. They don't have homologous chromosome, if that means anything to you. That one is the one that's evaluated. And then you could have uh, an, an offspring that's kind of weakly and is outcompeted by the two original species, parental species. So how do you form species for animals is you have to separate it with a geography barrier and let them with time become different with mutation but prevent them from reproducing in between each other with the geographical barrier like the Galapagos Island. You know, the islands would be a ge geographical barrier. Um, so that's for animals. Plants, they don't mind a pollen of another species fertilizing the ovule of another. It takes time because too much information, but it would be haploid two different types of chromosome, and then they would have to double the number of chromosomes called non-disjunction, too much information, and then it would be a true species. But when they looked at the biodiversity of plants in the Amazon, they retraced different plants. Uh, how, that's how they would um, produce the biodiversity. And that's it. Good luck in your exam. Thank you, Professor. And that's the end of the episode. As always, thank you for listening and supporting the podcast. Good luck on your exams, everyone, and have a good summer.